Hello and welcome back to Curiously Polar. My name is Chris Markward and we are again talking about polar stuff. <laughs> Lots of polar stuff. <laughs> and here's my polar friend, Henry. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm great. It's uh, pretty good. Um, well, you have a penguin means next I'm, to you. <laughs> it means I'm in the right podcast today. Yeah. Uh, talking about polar stuff. <laughs> well, really if, good. If, if anybody here should be confused about which podcast they're in, it's me because... I've been producing <laughs> podcasts left and right. It's a bit of a crazy time. COVID makes this a crazy time with a lot of home production, a lot of video productions. Um, and yeah, this is one of them. So if you're listening to this on your in your podcast app of choice, if you're listening to this online at curiouslypolar.com, um, then uh, just be aware this is also a video podcast this is also on youtube so you can watch us and i think watching us is great because then you can see henry's penguin and uh you can see the polar polar um uh the polar lights what are they called the aurora the northern lights <laughs> polar lights are completely all right is polar lights okay okay yes yeah <laughs> anyway northern lights you can see our, our nice little logo with the uh, polar bear meeting the penguin or our mascot and uh yeah henry covid19 is yes today's still topic a, it's still um, a topic it's interesting when you browse the media no matter where country uh, what country you're in you still are completely over flooded with uh covid news and it seems that there's not much happening in the world besides covid so i thought we're just hopping back onto the covid train and talk a little bit the impact of covid19 onto mm -hmm. Uh, polar research because one of the key drivers for my personal curiosity is um, the the research happening in the polar regions and I was wondering how is that actually affected and uh, you hear very little about that unless you dig into the right channels and that's what we want to talk about today. So uh, COVID definitely has impact on a lot of different things and polar research is one of them so uh, what do you want to start with? Yeah, I would love to start with um, the the basic idea of um, the remoteness of both polar regions. So we we whenever we talk about polar regions, especially in the Arctic, we know there are a lot of people living there. Uh, we talk about four million people in the greater Arctic area, and that always sounds a little bit familiar. That always sounds a little bit everything is quite close to each other. When we travel there, it it feels kind of remote, but on the other uh, other hand, you always think. The next port, the next airport is not so far away. And something similar has um, gotten into research um, in the globalized world um, where we travel um, yeah, on daily routine. We, we just have really adopted that kind of feeling that everything is so close to each other. But in COVID times, when things are just closing down, then we actually re uh, realize how um, remote those locations are. And uh, when we, for example, take uh, in Greenland, the ice core drilling projects, especially in uh, northeastern Greenland, where scientists for years already try to study the um, behavior of ice streams, try to understand ice streams. Why are they flowing so quickly? What's, um, you know, what's accelerating them? What's the topography underneath the ice streams? How are they actually um, adding up to... Um, change of eco, um, ecosystems in the ocean, and so on. All those questions are very much related to um, ice core drilling in, in northeast Greenland. And when we look at a map, we can see that this, besides the, the sheer size of Greenland, is already quite a remote um, place to do research um, in regular times. But if you now think that this just happens in a, in a time where most uh, air travel is completely grounded um, that gets even further away and especially Greenland which has closed um, its borders for um, international visitors that's kind of a, a very severe impact and we might think just ice core drilling um, can't be operated this arctic summer okay what's the big deal with that the big deal is that ice travels and our new snow layers are set on top which basically means, A, we don't have a continuous ice core, so we are missing the data from, from this winter. It's it's a really tricky thing to continue 
um, on that certain very specific ice core. The other thing is that the, the gear, the drilling gear, is still on the glacier, means the new snow accumulating on top of that just makes that very very difficult to to find so the next season when the when the scientists re, uh, return they need to dig that out and spend significantly more time to set up the new research or continuing the research so what is the significance of ice core drilling what are the what is the data that um, comes out of ice core drilling being used for uh, we've talked about um, ice core drilling in Antarctica uh, in in one episode here and ice cores contain um, snow layers in the snow layer or compressed snow layers it's, it's ice but um, in not compressed snow layers we have um, a lot of atmospheric bubbles so the air contains the the chemical concentration of um, of the air in that certain time when the snow uh, fell down and got compressed so we have a lot of internal data here from the stat of status of the of the atmosphere in that certain period if we have a continuous library here, we actually can um, get a very detailed look into the uh, past of Earth climate. Um, besides that, we also can, the further down we get, a uh, better idea of the, the bedrock topography underneath the glacier. And that uh, a specific ice core was, was hoped to get completed at around 2,660 meters to actually um, break through the ice and reach the backdrop, the underlying backdrop of the ice stream. And this is actually very, very important to understand behavior of, of ice streams. Mm -hmm. And that that uh, on its term is um, necessary information, very um, valid information to get idea how um, uh, yeah, sea level rise, for example, got affected by um, the discharge of ice from the Greenlandic ice sheet. Okay, so and this is uh, going on mostly in Greenland right now. Well, that's one of the, the key projects in, in uh, Greenland. It's not only going on in Greenland. We have um, some significantly larger ice core drilling projects also in Antarctica. But in Greenland, um, that's like the, the entrance point into Arctic research um, for us today. So in northeast Greenland, that big project is just on hold for the entire Arctic summer. We have a very, very short um, time frame where we actually can conduct research on location in the Arctic and if we are not able to to keep that window then we just have to postpone that for um, the uncertain time and hopefully next Arctic summer then okay. yeah from so what else what else is being influenced or being hampered by uh, by the COVID issue yeah we have like two major projects we have um the scientific village of uh, new orleans in in svalbard which is um probably um quite known and uh, new orleans is affected by those travel restrictions as well because new orleans is um part of svalbard which is governed by norway norway has um implemented quite some travel restrictions so the exchange of scientists coming out of the arctic winter into the arctic uh, summer that got slowed down and significantly um, endangered there so a couple of projects have been slowed down even though new orleans still remains in um yeah in full operation if you like just the the um, exchange of scientists have been um under much much more difficulties that's a uh, a one big thing the research in New Orleans is um, quite significant and it stretches over numerous um, yeah fields uh, what they're researching not the least um, the um, Atlantification of the Arctic Ocean where um, yeah what's research especially in Kongsfjord where New Orleans is uh, situated at but going from New Orleans into the Arctic Ocean directly and heading to the largest expedition or research expedition um, of all times, the COVID, um, yeah, the, the effects of COVID-19 have also affected uh, Mosaic Expedition, which is um, led by the Alfred Wagner Institute and their research icebreaker Pulastern. And the challenges connected here is that um, Pulastern uh, was frozen into the sea ice the entire winter so the entire dark season and was relying on exchange of scientists through um air traffic so um special airplanes 
were supposed to land on the ice floes and bring in new scientists every two months and um, just continually, uh, continuously just exchange um, the scientists so nobody burns out and uh, numerous projects can uh, can be tackled. And since the travel restrictions um, yeah, gripped in, that was slowed down tremendously. And for a project that got prepared over 10 years in advance, with a lot of fallback plans, nobody really had a pandemic um, in mind. So all those plans needed to be altered and the whole project slowed down. People had to stay much, much longer on, um, on, on Polar Stern. And eventually, no flight was um, taken to um, to the sea ice. So Polarstern actually needed to leave the anchorage at the huge ice flow they were anchored at and um, travel down to Svalbard, while two um, other research vessels from the Alpha Wegener Institute um, just picked up the um, exchange crew in Germany, actually, in Bremerhaven, and just traveled all the way up to Svalbard. So just to, to give you an idea how difficult um, this whole change is, the exchange crew needed to get isolated in Germany. So the whole process in advance was already slowed down to find the right um, chain of action. Then with a already huge delay in place, they needed to, um, to isolate for, for, uh, for two weeks before being able to go onto the uh, research vessels. And then they traveled from Bremerhaven to Svalbard to meet in a fjord there. And in the fjord on water, they exchanged the crews from uh, Polarstern onto those two vessels. And not only the crews, but also supplies, of course which is a, um, a very important factor as well. So, so the one thing I don't get is, the, so the Polastern is not there anymore. It moved back to Svalbard. Um, no, right now it um, went to Svalbard for the exchange and from there oh, just they the went back okay. into the ice, yes. Okay, and they couldn't do the exchange in the ice for what reason? The supply vessels are no icebreakers. Ah, there we go, okay. so. Wow. So it's, it's a it's of course also cost um, cost driven. So the, the the whole project is already um, a very huge budget um, project. So I assume that just getting in the icebreakers um, from uh, from partner countries would have been much more expensive, or those icebreakers are already allocated for other projects than getting the institute own research vessels from Alfred Wegener Institute um, into. Um, into that position. So Polarstern needed to leave the um, the sea ice, travel all the way down to Svalbard and travel back in. And what that implicates for the research is also that we don't have a continuous research on the sea ice for the entire period um, of the time. That means there is a lack of, of data in between. And that's, of course, a very, very sad story for the research projects going on there. Hmm. So this is the Arctic. Is there anything else in the Arctic that is as visible as the as the Mosaic project right now that has issues? Due there to are COVID? possibly a, a lot of um, research projects um, yeah. really um, tackled on to that COVID so problem. Um, Mosaic is pretty problem. much pretty much the one big one that gets all the visibility, but there is a lot of exactly. other stuff going on at the, at this time. Yeah. Exactly, but it's get, it's getting even bigger when you have a look down south to Antarctica. Um, just considering 40 permanent bases in Antarctica, which are also operated during winter. And when you just think back when all the uh, hustle with COVID started, that was in the peak of the Antarctic summer season. So in the winter of the Northern Hemisphere, we have the summer down in the south, meaning that all those uh, permanent stations, but also the summer stations have been fully operational. And... With COVID coming into place, um, new restrictions came into place and the, uh, the, the travel, um, which just slowed down and um, shut down and, and certain destinations completely, meaning that the, the stuff, the research stuff on those stations had a significantly longer stay on Antarctica. Traveling home was really difficult as we as expedition stuff already um, experience, but for those researchers even more, even though Antarctica uh, still today is the only continent not affected by COVID-19 yet, at least with no recorded case. The effects are different. And with the summer stations closing at the end of the summer, 
the winter stations had a big problem with uh, supplies, um, both in stuff, but also in crew. And um, we have seen that the, the numbers of research projects have been cut down tremendously, especially now when we are actually at the end of the winter and we're coming towards the beginning of summer now, we know already that a lot of research um, countries or researching countries have just minimized their research programs. Most of them have canceled them entirely, even though they always say it's not canceled, it's just postponed. Hmm. But what we face here is a huge undertaking if we put the entire research in Antarctica on hold for a whole year. That's a huge gap. It's a huge gap in research that we are facing here, and that's very, very difficult um, to to grasp. Just given the the overarch, uh, overarching um, sphere of how much um, is research in Antarctica, research is not only climate driven. Um, we have to understand certain glaciers like Thwaites Glacier, which is the largest ongoing research project in Antarctica, which has to be halted for a whole year now. We have atmospheric research. We have um, space research. No place on Earth is better suited to look into space than Antarctica, you, where you have almost no light pollution or no light pollution at all. We have um, oceanic research. We have so many different research topics here, and all of them have to be halted for a year, which is a significantly gap in the science world. So uh, the one thing that I have difficulty understanding is um, you can have uh, comprehensive uh, qu quarantine measures. So you could uh, send people there if you lock them away for two weeks somewhere, right? That's that's kind of the procedure. And we are looking at some long-term deployments there. So people don't just go there for a week and then return. They go to the Antarctic to do research for, I don't know, months in a row. So. Um, shouldn't it be possible to have a two-week quarantine for those people and then send them there? Because, I mean, Antarctica right now is pretty much co the only COVID-free continent we have, right? It's a very good question. Um, there are certain aspects um, getting into, the, into that question or into the answer on that question. Um, first, for, uh, first of all, have a look at the major research countries or the countries um, operating the major research stations, most of them are not somewhere close to Antarctica. So they have to travel all the way down through certain areas, um, like for example, the National Science Foundation, which is uh, going through uh, New Zealand. So they have to travel with all their stuff um, through the, a number of countries. Same goes for the German research program. They're going through South Africa. South Africa has just um, reached 500,000 cases um, of COVID recently. So traveling through those destinations, through those countries, um, inherits a certain uh, threat to the research staff and by that to the research stations. When you then um, deploy the stuff to Antarctica and you put them in two weeks quarantine and at that point something just happens or a COVID case um, becomes imminent and the person needs help, then you have to understand that there is no more isolated place on Earth than Antarctica. There is no hospital just around the corner. The medical care at the research station is very, very limited. You have to, to think about a dorm-like living in those research stations. Mm -hmm. It's really like a, like a student's dorm. In most cases, you're very close Makes to it, each other in those exactly those places. Yes, and even in the best years, this kind of situation makes it easy for diseases to spread. It's nothing that's really made for a pandemic. So reducing the number of scientists is already mitig uh, mitigating the the risk of an outbreak, but it definitely disrupts the 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 research. So it's not an easy answer to to that question, but for sure there are a number of factors. Um, playing in and um, the isolated um, situation of the research station is possibly the, the biggest threat to a possible case popping up. Hmm. Yeah, that's that's one thing that um, <clears throat> I've never been to the Antarctic, but to the Arctic and even up there in some places where you are far out, um, you have to really understand that you can't just 
be airlifted out to a hospital that easily. Um, it is really remote in some of those places. And if something happens, then um, then you have to deal with it right there. And if you don't have the according um, protective measures in place uh, at those, I don't know, sick bays that they might have, then that is going to turn into a problem, yes understand and airlifting always sounds um rather easy sounds but easy yes <laughs> it's not on a, on a continent like antarctica which is um consisting out of ice and you you are surrounded by the southern ocean yeah the weather phenomena make it not easy to um transfer stuff in the first place in regular times so one of the biggest um, assets you have to have as a research um, researcher for Antarctica is patience in, in regular times already because the flights are delayed very, very frequently. And delay does not mean for, for an hour or so, it, it's days and weeks. It can take ages for you in regular times to go to Antarctica. And now just imagine a serious situation, a serious medical situation in Antarctica. Evacuation is not a thing that just happens and a finger snap. That really is a big issue. Okay, so what what can we speculate? Where will this go? Um, for for well, twenty the, for twenty twenty, I think there will will probably be no change. But um, are there any plans in place for twenty twenty one to um, to re return to resume kind of a normal order of things? So the summer season of 2021 or 2020 to 2021 um, is already entirely put on hold. Mm -hmm. So the the um, association of all the research um, countries has just decided um, or just came to the conclusion that all the research projects are um, halted except for like the permanent stuff, which is already um, on the continent. Um, you have stations like McMurdo, of course, um, the U.S. station in, in the Ross Sea, which still will be operating um, with reduced personnel, of course, but on a, on a much, much lower level than recently. And the researchers who are um, left back in their home countries or in their institutes, of course, they can um, conduct some, some research from home, but they have to take um, data from previous years and what we what we will face in the next few years is that we have this gap of, of uh, recent data from particular this year when uh, COVID-19 just put everything on hold. And that's just something that's very, very difficult to understand, um, especially when it, for example, comes to um, significant research fields like climate change. We only have a few years um, left uh, to, to make some very, very significant changes to, worst, uh, to, to uh, avoid the worst. Um, of climate change consequences. So we technically can't afford a gap year uh, wait with research for another year. Hmm. So this is kind of hard to understand. But on the positive side, this year is going to be kind of a trail uh, trial run for um, Antarctic programs, um, preventative measures. So what we can see here is we, we will uh, see increased um, logistics in preventing um, the researchers bringing in diseases of all kind. COVID is something that's not going to disappear by tomorrow. So we might live with that for, for a few years, but we have to um, put measures into place to avoid uh, certain um, serious situations. And this is actually kind of the trial um, run for exactly that. So COVID-19 will remain a threat, but as critical as Antarctic um, climate research is, to the health of the planet, health of scientists and stuff always comes first. And that's something that underlines all the communication of uh, the different research institutions conducting um, operations in Antarctica. And the main goal is, of course, to send the people um, home in a good health as they got to Antarctica. And that's completely understandable. Okay, so yeah, we, we live in interesting times. Um, and by the way, just to date this episode, we're recording this on August the 11th, 2020, which is um, right in the middle of rising infection numbers all around the globe. So, um, yeah, not a very positive outlook, but um, let's let's try our best for the next episode to return to some more, uh, let's say, musical episodes and <laughs> get back into uh, 
<laughs> but a bit more cultural things. Okay, that was it for today. Thanks everyone for joining us um, either on the podcast or here on the video. If you want to see the video, there's a link in the show notes. Just tap that. It takes you right to YouTube to our little channel. Um, of course, you can find us online at curiouslypolar.com, which is our main website. That's our home base. And we are on Twitter and on Instagram at Curiously Polar. Until next week, take care, everyone, and bye-bye. <laughs>